I've got Park and Kirkig, La Hay Clear Cray of Mahan and Amaniata, it's a Lock Gurman, Agat Kirkig. Hello, everybody, and welcome. On a dark night in September, we listened to me haul across the Atlantic describing Kerry versus Cavan. And the Cavan youth were staring Kerry in the face, and their own age was staring him in the face. And Cavan won by four points, and Tom the Yank said, Kerry football. Is finished. And Rutherford has been hampered, and so has Castle Fall. Rochetta has fallen, Pittsburgh has fallen, Dawther has fallen, Curtin Lad has fallen, uh, the Foster has fallen. There's a right pile up. Neasy has uh, climbed over the fence and left his jockey there. And now, with all this mayhem, Farnaven has gone off on his own. I've been very lucky through the years. And I mean that really and truly. I wrote a letter to the then Director General, Dr. T.J. Kiernan, and I posted it on a Monday. I had no idea they were holding tests in Croke Park on the following Sunday. They were the last of a series of tests. And if, for some reason, I decided I wouldn't post the letter for a day or two, I would probably have got a reply to say, that I was too late. I think that anyone that has ever heard him will remember him for his, the simplicity of his descriptions of what was taking place out on the pitch. And for that alone, he'll be always remembered. No names mentioned, no scandal given, just direct, act, direct words. All my memories go, go back to childhood. I suppose from listening to the broadcast back in my own place in Valencia. I have vivid memories of those times, and I suppose, subconsciously, his uh, commentaries were an inspiration to us to, to, to try and, and be good at the game. Uh, he also did an awful lot of work abroad for Irish racing. He was the sort of ambassador for Irish racing. Uh, he represented us in Laurel Park and in the early days of international racing. And he was known throughout the racing world as, as Ireland's man. And uh, people probably don't, don't realise that. He did, he did much more than just commentate. When I was about nine or ten years old, I remember quite distinctly the first broadcast that Michal ever made. He broadcast the uh, semi-final between Monaghan and Galway in 1938. And my parents, God rest them, had promised to bring it to the All Ireland if Galway won. And so I had a special uh, interest in the game. I remember Michal then, and of course he was a uh, the one we went to the final, not a great game, but ever since then I've always admired him. A great commentator, great nice man. It was luck too that when I went in to see Dr. Kiernan, that when he did eventually put his head down after nearly laughing out loud when he saw the character in the school blazer that went in to discuss being a commentator with him, that he decided to take a chance because many another person would have said, run along, young man, and wait until you grow up. Eddie O'Connor, Giga jumps up for the ball, he has it. He's bundled his way past three men, and he, the referee blows his whistle and awards a hop, and from the hop, Dowling gets it and sends the ball over the bar for another Terry point, and Giga has gone down again. At home, I used to build uh, radios. Mm. This was my original interest in radio, was building from the technical end. And the house, well, was always a very sporty house. My father, Dr. Mercian, was very interested in sport. And uh, I heard commentaries from England and America and here and everywhere mm. else. And I thought, well, I'd have a go. And I wrote in and asked for a test. And uh, I got the test. It was a National Football League match between Wexford and Loud in uh, Croke Park, and um, I went along, did it. There were five others tested, and the commentary went back to the GPO, to Radio Air, and to Dr. Kiernan, who was director then, and he asked for the fellow who did the last five minutes, mm. would he do the second half? And the fellow that did the last five minutes was in his O'Connell School's cap, his O'Connell blazer, and he hasn't shut up since. Mm. Well, the first match that I actually broadcast was in uh, Mullingar in 1938, on August the 14th in 1938, between Galway and Monaghan. I got the large sum of three pounds ten shillings, 
and that was to include my expenses to get to Mullingar and back. From the early hours of that now historic Sunday morning, the crowd streamed to Croke Park. They came from all over Ireland. They came from all over the world. Never before had such a crowd attended any sports fixture in Ireland. Thousands came and failed to gain admission. Every possible vantage point was taken up, and some had come from a land beyond the sea to answer the call of final day. People nowadays with transistors up to their ears, I don't think they realize what the radio meant to people back in the late 30s, into the 40s, and even into the 50s, when in country places, uh, batteries were preserved yes. for the special programs. And the special programs all over the country were the matches. And on a Sunday, a radio would be put out uh, on a window in a large house that had a radio, and the neighbors would come in and listen to the commentary. It's long forgotten now, but I think that radio played a very important part in the life of the Irish people. Nowadays, we all talk about television being part of the life but in its own way, radio in those days was part of the life of the Irish people. I remember I used to spend my summers down on Uncle's farm in Westmead, out in the heart of the countryside, in a place called Farnham Maureen in the parish of Tubber Clare. And my uncle on this Sunday said, I'm going to bring you over to Morden's house to hear the wireless. And it happened to be the first broadcast of Michael O'Hare. It was uh, Galway versus Monaghan in the All-Ireland semi-final. So over we went, he holding my hand through the fields, and we went to Morton's house, went into the kitchen, and there was about 12 neighbours there. And uh, the wireless was sitting on the table, the magic box, and out was pouring music. And of course, everybody was totally fascinated by it. Where, where were these sounds coming from? Through the air, through this magic box. Then on came the match, and Michael. And then it was real magic. He was like the magician pulling rabbits out of a hat, and he was pulling his voice out of radios throughout the length and breadth of Ireland. And he had all the excitement and all the enthusiasm and the verve for entertainment that the young musician had. Lee Flaherty sends the players back behind, for this is a penalty. And Porrick Carney, with his hands on his hips, is walking up to take it. He takes it and sends it rasping into the back of the net. And Mayo are nearer cabin, but cabin are still out there in front. Glenn Quigley has come to set a half back. Calls the Wetford man, sends a high ball well up the field. Oh, a delightful piece of holding there. Holding up the ball by Len Gaynor. Passing it up now to Aline Devaney. Aline Devaney trying to get room to swing his stick. He just can't. Vincent Staples is after him. But he gets his puck in. Well in towards the goal mouth. Quigley blocks it down. And it's a goal! It's a goal! And then came those pulsating moments. Meade Paddy Megan races down the wing, dodges his way through, a hard shot towards the goal. Morris saves, but Bill Hastney is in, and the ball is in the net for a goal that put Meade on the highway to football on. And I wonder will he be satisfied with the point, with that line of defence in front of him at this stage of the game, I'm sure he will. Let's wait and see. He is not. It's that guy. It's the goal! The ever-active Tom Langham gets the ball in his hand and presses his way through for a goal that does much to put his county on the road to victory. Michael himself was perhaps the biggest influence in my working life, uh, even more so than my father, Mitchell. Now, my father had been the sports editor of The Independent in the 40s, and he had Michael O'Hare as his Irish racing correspondent. And that was a job Michael uh, did very well, but it wasn't enough because Michael had to be doing so many other things. At the time, he was doing broadcasting on Gaelic football and hurling as well. He was doing course commentaries as if just reporting on the race meetings wasn't enough. Then he would also do all sorts of other things. He was working for the turf club. He introduced the camera patrol for the turf club. And then he did the form book. And it was no surprise then, really, in 1961, when he was appointed the first head of sport for television, as it was known then. Television is at its best when it's covering something live, like sport. You know, when you're looking at a play or something like that, you have a rough idea how it's going to turn out. But uh, when you're looking at live sport, there's drama, there's excitement in every movement, because there's the mystery of, well, what's going to happen in the end. A game such as hurling and football, for example. Well, until the coming of television, people in America 
Well, they, they didn't know it existed. And now, with the showing of the hurling and football finals every year, there are a lot of people in America anxious to know a little bit more about it. And the same is true of the showing of the games over in, in Britain. The BBC have taken these games. He ran the department in a rather friendly kind of way. In fact, he often used the word family. Uh, he liked to think that we were a family. There was about 12 of us at the time. And uh, he would go for a lunch in the Montrose and he would call it a family lunch. He, he wasn't an authoritarian by any means. He was a very easygoing man. And he also didn't really have time for silly rules uh, as applied to broadcasting. It was all on for freedom. He would do his scripts sometimes if uh, they weren't thought out properly. He would put his thoughts down on the back of a matchbox. He applied all the professionalism that he applied to his commentating to the job nonetheless. He hated meetings though. He hated going to meetings uh, where people talked at length, uh, uh, trying to make up their minds about uh, specific things. He'd much rather to get out on the road and be on his way down to the Cora or Leopardstown, Croke Park or some uh, provincial venue. As the people who had them a moment ago are in fact dancing their way around out into the floor. And they're dancing in the street too. I don't know what it is. It might be the twist. It might be ring a ring a rosy. It might be some version of a 16-handed reel. They don't care. I don't care. They're all enjoying themselves. The paper hat's there too and another dancing group. Well, it certainly looks as if this is the spirit. And these two organizers in chief, they are, I can assure you, not uh, attached to the management, shall we say, but they're certainly organizing quite an amount of dancing and singing out there and having a certain amount of interference too. The poor lonely balloon there and the glasses and, well, the reason they're lonely is not the seen old parcel there with the beard on the left. They, uh, Smiling Noel Purcell with that white beard uh, just back from very hot climbs and we're glad indeed to see him amongst the very large crowd here tonight. Ooh. <laughs> but here the way, that way back to Cashel, but it's still standing. Right back to Cashel, let's say, but here he comes now. To this next number seven. And this is one of the problem fences. Not for Don Drum at the moment, and now he heads down to where he was really in trouble the last time. Number nine. The next is the water. He's clear there. Now this is where he stopped the last time. Not this time. Round he comes now towards Two fences to jump now, fence number 13 and fence number 14, which is the double. And now the double, wait for it. He's clear, he's clear. The man in the gap, 22 faults the first time, no fault this time, and I don't think there's any danger of a time fault. Stand by for the announcement, and there's a relief, Tommy Wade, and a relief, Dundrum. What a feeling it must have been for Tommy, wondering if the horse would stop. And that means that Ireland cannot be caught. Ireland have won the Aga Khan Cup. Look, let's get back to that punch again. Where has that punch been ever since? The, the punch, punch that knocked... Sonny Liston kicking in the first round. Where has it been ever since? The punch is still here. I used it on Jerry Quarry. I used it on James Ellis. I just changed the name. Then it was the ankle punch. Now it's called the linger on. The which? Linger on. It don't knock you out. It just makes you linger on. <laughs> <laughs> now let's talk about Joe Fraser. Uh, that fight in Madison Square Garden, uh, March last year, at the end of that fight, you were not the hero, but the vanquished. How did you feel that night? That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah, that's what you thought. Let me tell you something. I whipped Joe Frazier. Our nine rounds, I whipped Joe Frazier. I beat his face unrecognizable. Yeah, but he hit He you went to the hospital for one month. He hit me hard and I fell. Henry Cooper knocked me down. Sonny Banks knocked me down. Billy Daniels knocked yeah, me down. Yeah, but even before he knocked you down, Mohammed, he really hit you that way. Hey, but he couldn't follow it up. I was out on my feet, but I was so great I came through. There was one, one mystery to me that night was that 
You know, we've always looked upon you as the very fast, the, the man who danced around dance. the ring. I you didn't, didn't dance that I was night. Off for Why? Three, I was off for three and a half years. I didn't really have the confidence I should have. I didn't know how I would do. I was preserving myself and pacing myself. If you saw my last night with Jerry Quarry, a man who gave me trouble when I first came back, I played with him. I'm totally different now. My timing is back. Joe Frazier's on a chicken farm retired, fighting nobody's. He's ducking. I'm ready. And the world know I'm ready. And it breaks to Pat Fitzgerald. He's been chased by two kill Kenny men. He flips it back to Mick Waters, and Mick sends it. Long clearance well up the field, putting Cork into the attack. The ball in front of the goal. The ball right in front of the goal now. And another shot by John Bennett. And it's a goal. And Mick Reynolds in possession. Well, away he goes. He's gone 10, 20 yards now. Tips it in now to Sean Cleary, who's 40 yards out. Sean into Manny McDonough. Manny McDonough in front of the goal, cutting his way through. Takes a shot at the goal. In the goal. As Mick Morris sends this high ball in towards the centre. Martin York kicking it out. Mick Morris getting ready to draw on it and root it way up the field towards Christy Tyrrell. Christy Tyrrell tapping it out to the oncoming Cyril Dunn. Cyril Dunn going right, then left. Now trying to sell more dummies to Seamus Murphy. It's not an easy sale, but he's half succeeding, he has succeeded, up to Manny McDonough, up and on the right, Manny cutting into the centre, Porter Donahue holding on to him and there's a free for Gallagher. Johnny Cullity in at the goal, anxiously watching to see where this ball is going to hop or is it going to go over the bar. And it's gone, over the bar, a point for Galway. I think he, he was an embellishment to the whole game, I think he popularised it more than any player or group of players could possibly have done. Mihal is the man that made the GA, I think. Well, of course, my memories of, uh, of Mihal go back to my early playing days. And that's really when Mihal came into its own, at about the time I commenced playing as well, into county. And in my humble opinion, nobody can pay adequate tribute to Mihal O'Hare for what he did for the games, how he got people interested, and the mood he created for games and in the people's minds from Sunday to Sunday, it made our period of our playing period anyway unforgettable. He was contributing to it with everything he did and everything he said. Uh, my outstanding memories will go back to the 50s when I was listening to broadcasting matches. And we listened to the matches and then we all went out to hurl afterwards and we were all broadcasting matches. We were Christy Ring or Nicky Rackard or whatever. And uh, I suppose those sort of memories would live and it sort of inspire us as young potential players to try and... I remember I made my debut as a minor, I suppose, on the senior team in 1959 uh, in a replay against Waterford. And um, I remember thinking to myself, if, uh, if I could even get the ball Michael O'Hare would have to mention me. <laughs> so uh, I, I remember that before the game as a young 17-year-old, I suppose, playing in my first All-Ireland. The growth in the inter-county interest, at least, was solely due to me all at that time, particularly in the time of radio. And the atmosphere in rural Ireland in particular is, was unforgettable because I came from rural Ireland and I can always remember uh, the expectations for the week that was leading up to be Hall's broadcast. I suppose I remember when I was young, uh, starting off that he uh, listening to him broadcasting the game. I was always saying, would I ever see the day when I'd be in a, in a position like that where he'd be broadcasting about me? But and it all came to be in, in, in the long run, you know. So uh, that in itself was a great thrill, you know. As someone who enjoyed playing the game at the highest level at a great era in Tipperary hurling. I can tell you that the seeds of my love for hurling were sown for me by Michal O'Hare in the 30s and early 40s. He brought hurling in real forum, in picture forum, in television forum, into the homes of a very rural part of Tipperary, where I grew up as a young boy. I loved to hear his voice, and we went home afterwards and tried to emulate the feats of the great men whose actions he described on the playing fields of Ireland, whether it was Torless, Cork, Limerick, or Croke Park. The GAA, and I can say myself, 
as well, we owe an awful lot to that mighty man, me hall or her. Ni veg a la head a reshaun. He was Mr. G. the no doubt about it. He gave it 40 or 50 years of his life and he was the best PR man they ever had. He, yeah. like everybody, everybody was a follower of the GA when Michal here was in, was in real action. I, I don't think anybody could ever fit his boots. There's no doubt that the descriptions that he gave of what happened on the field were the learning processes which we used to perfect our skill and to eliminate the feats that we had listened to in the afternoon. I could place where I was when certain things happened as, as he described them. For instance, I can recall the, a famous all Ireland semi-final between Kerry and, and Antrim, and apparently the, the Kerry backs were fairly uncompromising because he used an expression, and once again, out goes the hand and down goes the man. <laughs> and I can remember that as clearly as if it were only yesterday it were said. And of course, I can remember where I was and who I was with when the all Ireland was uh, played in New York, which he described so, so vividly for us all as we, we listened to it. When I was a young kid, listening to a woman on the, the wireless, as we call it then, his master's voice, the others, and um, you'd hear, uh, obviously he was talking about Chris Ring, he bends and he lifts his strikes, and then you'd hear no more for about five minutes, all had to break loose, and, and you know it was a goal. Uh, that voice was a voice in a million, and I must say, I got a great thrill when I went down to meet me Holler here, met him in New York, actually, for the first time in 1970, and uh, to have him call out my name in latter years in, in, uh, in, in matches, um, it was a great honour. I think he was uh, not alone the best commentator in the world, which is uh, everybody agrees on that, one of the nicest men that you could meet in the day of He's a lovely man. We never thought of a time when there wouldn't be a Michal here. One assumed when, when uh, he, he was commentating that he would be there forever, but was the way, because he, he was there from, from, from as long as I could remember, and I couldn't envisage the games being described by anybody else. And I don't think... Uh, the void that was left in the relationship between the public and, 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 and the games was ever adequately filled when, when he actually went. Dermot early. Nick Crane gone up on his right. Dermot still going up. Crane gone inside now. Assisted effort at a lovely point. And it comes over to Frank Cummins. Frank Cummins going soloing up the field now. He's on the 50. It's 40, it's 30, it's 21, it's a shot, and it's a goal! It's a goal! Up to Eamon Donahue. Eamon 50 yards out, up now to Liam Higgins. Liam Higgins. Still going on. A dangerous ball goes again. Kavner, a shot, and a goal! All out to the centre of the field, Pat Henderson up field to Eddie Kerr, a lovely touch over the head of the Corkman, and then getting the ball across to Kieran Purcell. Kieran Purcell from out the field, and it's another point for Kilkenny. 